This video is sponsored by Frome.co. Anyone care to guess which film is represented by these color strips? Here's a little tip. The overall color palette can often be misleading. Try to focus on the high contrast pops of complementary colors. That's the real tell. Any guesses? Come on, it's so easy. Just start at the front here and then work your- Oh wait, hold on. Ah, perfect. There are lots of films that feel like they were made for 2020. Contagion's probably the most obvious choice. Audiences were already watching that one on repeat just days in the quarantine. Idiocracy comes to mind. Something about the United States ignoring good scientific intel while politicians grandstand, everyone starts buying in bulk, and corporations pretend to care about anything but our collective buying power really spoke to me this year. Welcome to Costco. I love you. Jesus, this was supposed to be satire, not prophecy. The thing hits different in 2020. Nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. Hell, even Independence Day took on newfound relevance. Put your mask back on! But only one of my top contenders for the title of Perfect Film for 2020 actually came out in 2020. A film that seamlessly captured our collective fugue state. A reality as surreal as it is immediate. As technicolor as it is dark. As frustrating as it is galvanizing. It also just so happened to be the last film I saw in theaters before I entered quarantine. I call that irony, but I'm pretty sure irony died sometime in March. Suicide Squad was a tough act to follow. Not because it was so good, but because it was so, uh, something other than good. Are you the devil? For what it's worth, I didn't exactly hate it, not entirely anyway, but only because it set its sights so low it was almost impossible to miss. Don't forget, we're the bad guys. But it was far from a flop. In fact, it's still the fourth highest grossing DCEU film at the time of this writing, and that's without getting a release in China. But I think the common wisdom in Hollywood is that these box office figures represented the pre-release hype, not the reception of the actual movie. A suspicion that was seemingly confirmed when it then posted the second biggest drop in DCEU ticket sales in its second week of release. In what has become a time-honored tradition of the DCEU, when audiences didn't quite like what they saw, DC implemented a massive narrative and tonal ship for the next installment. It's a hell of a problem from a narrative standpoint. Where do you go with the story of Harley Quinn when the single most despised element of your last film was the Joker and the movie ended like this? Let's go home. You start by getting Joker out of the picture. Harley gets dumped in the opening scene, the opening shot really, and immediately enters the wallowing stage of the breakup. She's out on her own for the first time in years and doesn't really know what to do with herself. She doesn't immediately tell anyone that she and the Joker broke up, though. Will your paramour be joining us this evening? Not tonight, Romy. Not tonight. Because her relationship with the Joker insulated her from all sorts of violent reprisals. Being Joker's girl gave me immunity. The inciting incident isn't the breakup itself so much as Harley's public declaration that they've broken up. Harley Quinn just called open season on herself. That's when everyone comes out of the woodwork to try and get a piece of her. I've waited a long time for this. You have? Oh. And in order to get the local crime boss, Roman Sionis, to spare her life, for at least a couple of hours anyway, Harley offers to recover the missing Bertinelli diamond on his behalf. And then we're really off to the races. Won't let you down, Romy. I promise. Let's make it half a mil. It's more fun if she's got competition. Send it to every mercenary in Gotham. I love Birds of Prey so much it makes me angry. That's not just the line. It really does give me pause to think about how much I like this movie. On the one hand, I didn't even know I wanted a movie quite like this until after I saw it. So part of me wonders if I really know my own taste half as well as I think I do. My other concern is that this film went so underappreciated in its time, barely breaking 200 million worldwide on an $80 million budget plus marketing costs, that I fear we'll never get anything quite like it ever again. Mr. J once lost a rare photograph of a nude Eleanor Roosevelt and I found it in a bird's nest in Robinson Park. Now I know I'm usually pretty big on letting people's own tastes guide their viewing habits. Far be it from me to tell you what you should and shouldn't like and all that. But today that's not good enough. It's not enough for people to simply understand my tastes. As a much better YouTuber than me once said, 
I don't want acceptance. I want converts. In order to cast as wide a net as possible, this video is going to be one part analysis for all the people who maybe saw Birds of Prey and for whatever reason couldn't appreciate its genius, and one part good old fashioned review to try and help convince the people who haven't seen Birds of Prey yet to maybe get going on that. An analysis and review. The world's first anal view. It's what Harley would have wanted. Part one. How much do I love thee? Let me literally count the ways. You know when I knew we were off to a good start? Right here, during the studio logos. Note the choice of music. The marketing campaign for Suicide Squad prominently featured a rather somber cover of I Started a Joke by Confidential MX and Becky Hansen. And it's not like that was a bad choice, even though somber covers in DC trailers are kind of a meme now. But Birds of Prey starts with a much more whimsical instrumental version of The Joke's on You by Charlotte Lawrence. I love the contrast here, the thematic pivot from Harley as victim to Harley as emancipator. Nothing like a protagonist with a little agency to get you invested in her story. Harley narrates Birds of Prey, and as such, the first half is told all out of order. Hold up, hold up. I'm telling this wolf wrong. I like this from the jump, because there's both a narrative and thematic reason for doing it. From a narrative standpoint, it makes sense that a character as traumatized and neurodivergent as Harley would backtrack, lose her train of thought, and revise her own narrative in midstream like this. And from a thematic standpoint, this is the story of Harley's emancipation, and a big part of that is letting Harley be the author of her own story. And I'm telling it, so I'll start where I fucking want. But Birds of Prey is also very much an ensemble picture, and in the purest sense of the word. Everyone in this movie is in it for completely different reasons, and want completely different things. Harley's trying to move past her breakup and figure out how to keep herself alive without the Joker's protection. You know, Harlequin's nothing without a master. Renee Montoya is a beleaguered GCPD detective who's trying to track down the Bertinelli diamond while her efforts are continually obstructed by her disinterested co-workers. You're only a few years younger than me and you're still behind that desk. You wanna go there? Cassandra Kane is an orphan pickpocket who accidentally transforms herself into a MacGuffin halfway through the movie, and Dinah Lance is literally just trying to survive her first week on the job without becoming an accessory to murder. Oh, and then there's the crossbow killer. I'm not the crossbow killer! Oh, and then there's this mysterious vigilante with no known alias who's going around killing random gangsters connected to the diamond. They call me Elena Bertinelli. For fuck's sake! What I find so interesting about this group is that, unlike most ensemble casts, they've really got virtually nothing in common. I know people say that the Avengers don't have anything in common either, but they're all society's favored sons in some way or another, right? Whereas the Birds of Prey truly aren't anything alike, save for the fact that Gotham's patriarchal power structures have deemed them all fundamentally inadmissible, expendable, disposable. It's Do as you're told! Go! At the start of the film, they're just five assholes who don't give a shit about each other. Know what a Harlequin is? Janky ass clown and bad eye makeup? Oof. Ouch. Who just so happen to keep crossing paths. But by the time their cross purposes finally bring them all into the same room together, they realize they've got a common enemy, and that's how you kick off a third act, baby. We're gonna have to work together. Would you? Yeah. If this sounds like a lot to keep track of, it's really not. Screenwriter Christina Hansen does a great job of keeping the plates spinning. The motivations are always crystal clear, and the momentum only moves forward, even during the flashbacks. In fact, I think the narrative structure is actually kind of amazing. The story is told in loose chronological order up until Harley Storm's police headquarters at the start of Act 2, and then it rewinds and shows us what all the other characters were doing up until that point. It's a great way to introduce four brand new characters to the audience without letting everything drag on for too long, by letting the audience know in advance about this upcoming narrative choice. Choke point. If you want to see what this looks like all diagrammed out, like one of those screenwriting YouTube channels, I'm not one for custom motion graphics, but I do have this frome we could take a look at. All this is Harley's journey up until the point where she attacks police headquarters at the start of Act 2, and then she rewinds to a couple of days earlier and tells us all what Dinah Lance, Detective Montoya, and Cassandra Kane were doing up until that point. If you were watching the film in chronological order, the movie would look something like this. Not necessarily any dynamite revelations, but I find the contrast interesting. 
Anyway, I'm convinced if somebody like Chris Nolan did it, there'd already be like a million YouTube videos about it. The humor in this film is exactly my tastes, and much smarter than I think most critics give it credit for. Don't call me dumb. I have a PhD, motherfucker. There was one reviewer from Blu-ray.com who didn't much care for Montoya's t-shirt gag. Montoya wearing a lewd t-shirt after being blasted by hot garbage is the level of funny business in this picture, leaving Birds of Prey pretty dry when it comes to laughs. Your mom's pretty dry when it comes to laughs. But see, look, the joke isn't that Montoya's wearing an I shaved my balls for this t-shirt. I mean, I laughed. But that's not the actual punchline. That's only the setup. The punchline comes at the end of the scene, after you've already forgotten all about Montoya's shirt, when the police chief looks at her and says, And Miss Montoya, we do have a dress code. <laughs> They do it again later in the film. The punchline isn't when Harley insults Doc's cooking. You always want extra chili with number 32, so you don't have to taste his cooking. The punchline comes two scenes later, when Huntress walks in and says, Give me number 32. Mild. That's planting a payoff. Other movies try to do this too, but it often comes off just forced and tired. Hey, you try and entertain a 10-year-old when you can't leave the house. You know the lengths that I've gone to? Close-up magic. And then at the end of the scene... How'd you do it, Scott? Do what? The car trick? But it's a punchline without any emotional honesty. This isn't speaking to anything that's ever actually happened to someone in real life. Seriously? Whereas you can definitely tell that Hodson's been lectured by a man with half her talent about her choice of wardrobe before. Speaking of wardrobe, can we talk about costumes for a sec? The one and only thing that I remember from my high school art classes is that silhouettes are usually the first thing that the eye notices. And when you look at the silhouette of Harley's costume from Suicide Squad, it seems pretty clear to me that Margot Robbie's body is meant to be the costume. Like, it's literally just a skin-tight raglan and short shorts. I guess sometimes they put her in a jacket, but that feels like it's just an excuse to give her something to take off. Now I know you could make the argument that there's an in-universe explanation for why she dresses so aggressively for the male gaze. Namely, that she does it for the benefit of the Joker. But there's very little in the actual text to support that, to use my new favorite euphemism. All the movie seems to suggest with any clarity is that low angle shots of bicolor booty shorts tested really well with at least one of the four quadrants. By contrast, in Birds of Prey, Harley's outfits feel like real extensions of her personality, to say nothing of the glorious silhouette. And even though she's actually showing about as much skin as she did in Suicide Squad, it's never in a way that's meant to fetishize her body. These outfits make her look more comfortable, not less. You can actually wear this stuff in a fight. You might look kooky. When the fuck does she have time to do a shoot But you won't be picking bloody sequins out of your thigh gap for a week. Ugh. <laughs> that was uncomfortable just to say. Speaking of fights. I don't know about you guys, but I'm getting real tired of weightless wonders battling it out in Bryce 3D for 20 minutes at the end of every superhero film. The fight scenes in Birds of Prey are the total antithesis of what you get in your typical DCEU CGI slugfest. Gimme Harley smacking people with a baseball bat over all the Cape Crusaders of this godforsaken universe any day. I winced more at Harley's two leg breaks. And by two leg breaks, I mean two instances in which she breaks a grand total of five legs than I did throughout the entire last act of Man of Steel. I want to single out the finale in particular, not even the booby trap fight, but the roller skate chase sequence that comes after as one of my new favorite superhero action sequences. It's weird to me how even diehard fans of the superhero genre will mock the ubiquity of big CGI sky beams and mocap villains, but the second you give them a grounded action sequence that plays out on an aggressively human scale with minimal superpowers and no sacrificial martyrs, everybody whines. The real tell for me is that I can recall, almost beat for beat, all the dramatic reversals in this chase. Harley gets knocked down right up front, but then Huntress whips her back into the fight, she catches up to Roman, navigates her way from the back of the car to the front. I remember everything that takes her either one step closer or one step further away from her goal. Compare that to the end of, say, Endgame. Now I know plenty of fanboys will be able to recount the finale of Endgame shot for shot, but all I remember is a list of things that happened, not how the sequence actually played out. Like, we all remember when Cap picked up the hammer and reinforcements arrived, and the woman had their group shot for no canonical reason whatsoever, and it's not that nobody can recall the sequence, it's that the sequence doesn't matter, because none of these events constitute a dramatic reversal. It's all just weaponized nostalgia masquerading as dramatic tension. Catch me. <laughs> Something else my script consultant noticed was that Harley tends to do a lot of throat jabs. Harley, 
work. Is this just a convenient finisher? Or is the film actually commenting on Harley's desire to silence the men who would seek to stand in her way? Well, it works whether it's intentional or not. And I think that's pretty cool. I can count on one hand the number of times I thought a superhero film was actually trying to imbue the themes into the fighting style of one of its characters. You'd love to see it. Oh. Hey, son? Yeah. Part two, I'm not mad. I just want to balk. So I get out of the theater after my first screening of Birds of Prey, and I go online to see what other people have been saying. And the reception seems pretty lukewarm. Lots of damning with faint praise. There seem to be a lot of critics who will like golf clap Margot Robbie's performance and then offer these really snooty critiques about absolutely every other element in the film. And I mean, subjectivity is subjectivity. You're gonna like what you're gonna like, but I swear I can tell when these critiques aren't being offered in good faith. Every armchair analyst in the movie business knows that writers are supposed to show, don't tell. And one of the first criticisms I heard about the film was that Harley's voiceover in the first act does way too much telling at the expense of showing. I was the brains behind some of Mrs. J's greatest stunts. Not that he let anyone know it. And here, look. I know Save the Cat has a lot of great tips in it. I know your screenplay wouldn't be the same without it. But the thing is, it's entirely possible to both show and tell at the same time. When Harley tells us all about her infamous criminal exploits, the movie's actually showing us that she's an extremely unreliable narrator. And luckily for me, I have all my best ideas drunk. I have the best idea. See, look, not five minutes later. Harley Quinn just called open season on herself. She did not think this one through. Yeah, no shit, I didn't think it through. Like half the plot holes and continuity errors that these professional online critics point out are basically just their refusal to suspend their disbelief or accept an unreliable narrator. Another criticism I heard a lot was about all the underdeveloped characters. Not even Honest Trailers was immune from this one. DC does not stand for developed characters. I'm just saying, I know more about Katana than these ladies. No, you don't. That is factually incorrect. You know Black Canary and Huntress's entire family histories and how those histories motivate their current struggles. You know all about how Montoya is discriminated at work and like 16 different self-destructive coping mechanisms she's developed. I swear, if character traits aren't made manifest by some prop, most superhero film aficionados don't even seem to notice. And look, for all the mystique surrounding the art of character creation, it's literally just Three things, who wants what from whom, what happens if they don't get it, and why now? Everything else is just exposition. Even the costumes, these glorious costumes, weren't spared from critique. And yet the men who go online to moan and groan about how these outfits aren't sexy enough for them are some of my all time favorite posts on the internet. They're missing the point in like 17 different ways. They're not dressing so that you can fawn over them. They're dressing for comfort, care, and combat, you know, Kind of like every male superhero that these guys love and adore. The whole point of the movie is that Harley isn't gonna kowtow to men's interests. What's especially weird to me is how so many men seem to think that Harley dressing in a crop top and unzipped overalls somehow transforms her into this unfuckable hag. Something entirely divorced from the very ideation of sexuality. And yet if I did it. A lot of these same viewers would thank me to not. I am going to check my analytics, by the way, to see if there's a spike or a drop in viewership right here. There was one guy on Twitter, I don't want to put him on blast, but there was definitely one guy who said that every fight scene in the film went on for 30 seconds too long. I mean, did he time them? like with a stopwatch. Another guy said the director had to work harder to define a style. And uh, I, I mean, did, did we watch the same movie? Run, piggy, run! So as not to sound too unbalanced, I did think it strained credulity sometimes when Harley would take on like three armed goons at the same time and not one of them could get a single round into her. But then it's not like male-led superhero films aren't chronically guilty of this too. And so long as we're talking about men, I feel like I can make a whole video about the men of Birds of Prey and real world men's reactions to them, which are as fascinating and telling as any other critique of the film. Roman Sionis is the villain I've been waiting for my whole life. Woo! 
Who's having a good time? You are. He's so stupid, so vapid, so chronically uncomplicated. Is that a snot bubble? And that's the point. Fuck family. I'll do respect, but fuck that. A point which seemed to go right over a lot of male reviewers' heads. God, stop. Because You're gonna do that thing where you open up a weird ass case of torture devices while inexplicably detailing your master plan and how I don't fit into it. I'm building a better- Seriously, you don't have to, really! That same Blu-ray.com reviewer from before, in particular, seemed to think that Roman was a real problem. Quinn adds narration to spackle over the cracks, which are apparent from the get-go. Most notably with Roman, who's introduced as the Black Mask, but he doesn't actually become the villain for another 75 minutes, and it's never really understood why he wears a mask. Why does Roman wear masks? Why, movie, why? How could you leave Blu-ray.com hanging like this? Five out of ten. You want to know why Roman liked masks? This is why. Look at those little ears. His little haircut. Uh -huh. yeah, he's a thousand years old, and now wow. he's just an ornament in my living room. Ooh. I love it. He likes him because he likes him. The whole point is that there's no substance to this guy. You're building a criminal empire because daddy kicked you out of Janice Corp, and you think this is a big fuck you, but in actuality, it's a very misguided attempt to win back his respect. I get it. You're really not as complicated as you think. And Roman wasn't the only villain who attracted undue criticism. Chris Messina stars as Victor Zaz, Roman's obsequious right-hand man, and plenty of male critics weren't impressed by him either. Blu-ray.com for the hat trick, Messina is the least threatening actor in Hollywood. But predators don't usually announce their predatory tendencies with their steely looks and their cold, dead eyes. In my limited, but very real experience with real world abusers. They're not these dashing criminal masterminds. They're usually just narcissistic schmoozers who've leveraged their privilege into positions of power. There's a certain flavor I keep detecting in a lot of the negative reviews of the film, especially the reviews authored by men. They seem to want the male characters to be cooler, more dashing, more dangerous. Performatively dangerous, anyway. They're plenty dangerous already, but as best I can figure, certain reviewers seem to want them to be dangerous in a way that seems like it'd be fun to emulate. But Birds of Prey doesn't allow that. Even their most gratuitous displays of power aren't any fun to watch. A lot of men seem to perceive this as a fault of the film, but it's not. On the contrary, it's the whole point. I present the scene where Roman forces a woman to strip in his club at knife point as the gold standard in how to film sexual violence without inviting the viewer to partake in the exploitation. Because this is how actual bad guys come across in real life. It's not like you're standing there, being abused, and yet you're still able to somehow appreciate their brilliance or backstory. They're just volatile, narcissistic control freaks with short tempers and chronic entitlement issues. I know some people say that Roman and Zaz were coded as gay lovers, and I'll be the first to admit that that'd be sketch as hell in the year of our Lord 2020. And while I'm not gonna pretend like that interpretation is impossible. So are you guys gay in the movie? It's very complicated. Their relationships is, is very much uh, based in there's a want and a need in there for sure. I definitely think more people should familiarize themselves with narcissistic personality disorders and the sycophants who enable them before they pass judgment. Fuck, these are my things. This diamond is my things. Yes. My things. Fucking fuck. Part three. Not the superhero film I deserve, but the superhero film I needed. You want to know why this moment in Batman v Superman didn't work? Save Martha! It's because no one in the history of hominids has ever experienced the emotion that Batfleck is experiencing right here. Why did you say that name? There's no emotional authenticity. It's completely manufactured. It doesn't reflect any crisis of conscience that any living, breathing human has ever actually had. What would you even call this emotion? Why did you say that name? Birds of prey is the complete antithesis to that. We've all experienced these emotions, even if the circumstances were wildly different. That's why Harley losing a sandwich has more of an impact on an audience than whatever the hell's happening here. Why did you say that name? It's his mother's name. This year, perhaps more than any other, I needed emotional authenticity from my movies. Look, we all know 2020 is bad. In fact, it's so bad, it's not even fun to make fun of how bad it is anymore. But I, for one, have no interest in power fantasies right now. I want emotional honesty. I want protagonists who get their teeth kicked in, who fuck up fast and then pick up speed, who hit rock bottom and then start digging, who could go so far as to save the world and still not count as a hero. Harley did everything society told her to do in order to be successful. She overcame an abusive childhood, went to school, got a PhD, saved the world. And what did she get for it? 
First, people mocked her for clinging to the Joker. He is going to be running right back into his arms the minute he snaps his fingers. And then nobody changed their opinion of her when she decided not to go back to him. Hey, you're the asshole no one likes. She's not the protagonist I deserve this year, but she's absolutely the protagonist I needed. Hollywood, don't you dare pass on whatever Kathy Yan wants to direct next. This market is so starved for the contributions of people who don't look at Batman and think, God, I wish that were me. I read one interview with Margot Robbie, who was one of the producers of this film, God bless her, where she said, Harley needs friends. Harley loves interacting with people, so don't ever make her do a standalone film. It's hard to overstate how much I love this, because with all the flash and aplomb that comes with directing a superhero film, Film. An R-rated ensemble superhero film with explicit feminist themes and a market super saturated by Snyder fanboys, no less. It's really just about learning to be comfortable with yourself and maybe finding some friends along the way. Fuck that guy. Yeah. Tacos? God, if that isn't all I want out of life right now. That and universal healthcare. But then maybe Harley can help with that too. This video was sponsored by Frome.co. Frome creates beautiful canvas art centerpieces that depict the chromatic chronologies of your favorite films, with each color strip representing each sequential frame in the film. So this is the video I've wanted to make ever since I first found out about Frome. The video where I literally pull up a canvas and use it to analyze a film's narrative structure. But there's still so much more to learn from these things. Birds of Prey is a very colorful film, with each scene packed with contrasting complementary colors, the ones that sit across from each other on the color wheel. It made me wonder what the average color of each of these frames would be before I even saw the from. Well, it turns out what we've got here is a visual representation of all the high contrast color temperatures for each scene. Anyway, this is all very cool to me, and I think every film fan should have one. They just revamped their website, so you can now search not only by popularity and genre, but by color palette as well. They've got nearly a thousand films to choose from. So not only do they have the super popular stuff like the DC and the Marvel films, but they've also got much more obscure stuff like A Matter of Life and Death, The Red Shoes, and Black Narcissus. For those of you who want your very own Powell and Pressburger wall. You can even submit your own suggestions for new films through their website. They went and added Brooklyn and 300 Rise of an Empire simply by my request. So if you're in the market for an expertly stylized canvas art centerpiece that says as much about your own taste as it does a given film, head on over to from.co where you can get 10% off your order by using the referral link from.co slash cold crash pictures. No discount code required. Just be sure to follow the referral link in the description of this video. That's from.co slash cold crash pictures. Now I know what you're thinking. Yes, it has pockets.